Welcome to Oak Hills Church. We are overjoyed that you decided to worship with us this week. We know you could be watching a football game right now or even catching up on your Netflix series, but you decided to tune in and worship God this week. We want to invite you over the next few minutes before we get started to connect with us. That's very easy. Simply text CONNECT to 210-585-2585. We will reach out to you and see how we can help you take the next steps in your journey. We also would love for you to connect with us if you're watching Facebook Live or even on YouTube. Simply let us know where you're from and let us know some of the insights and how God is speaking to you as you worship with us today. Another great way to connect at Oak Hills Church is through giving. We are so thankful for how generous you are. And we believe that giving is an act of worship. If you need a link to give today, text Oak Hills to 77977. Now, go find your Bible, gather up everyone in your house or where you may be, and let us prepare our hearts to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Welcome to Oak, Oak Hills Worship. We're so glad you're with us today. Let me read from Psalm 59. It says, but I will sing of your strength. In the morning, I will sing of your love. For you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. You are my strength. I sing praise to you. You, God, are my fortress, my God on whom I can rely. Yeah. 
Yes, God, you do great things. Let's read together from Psalm 24. It says, Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Lose heart, oh my soul, oh my soul. Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. There is peace in the storm, in the storm. So don't forget, He is Lord, He is Lord of all. There is a God who saves, both new, strong, and mighty. Freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. So lift your eyes, stand it on, stand it on. There is one, only one, where my help comes from. There is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in His name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up the shout of praise. The lion roaring, Jesus, the King of glory. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name over all. Jesus reigns, I know, I know. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name. Over all, Jesus reigns, I know, I know. Let's read that last verse from Psalm 24. Who is he, the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. There is a King of glory. There is a God who saves. One who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in His day. Open the gates of heaven. Lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring. Jesus, the King of glory. There is a lion roaring. Jesus, the King of glory. Till I lay my head, oh, I will 
of God where you are right now, whatever room you may be watching from your living room or maybe a hospital room, if you've experienced the goodness of God, just right now, just raise your hand and just say, thank you, Lord. Maybe if you've got a a chat there, you want to go on the chat and just put some praise hand emojis or some clap emojis or something. Just let us know how you've experienced the goodness of God. He has been so good to all of us. And I'm just so grateful that we get to be together right now. I mean, wherever you may be, if you are in San Antonio or you're in San Marcos or if you're in Philadelphia or if you're in the, in the Philippines, we want you to know that you are Oak Hills family and we are glad that you are here. You know, this online church thing, it's as real as you want it to be. 
Because church, it's never been about a place. It's always been about people. And we want to encourage you, as people come in together, we also want you to know that along with this sermon series that we're in right now, Searching for Springtime, we have study tools that go along with it. And I want to encourage you to do that. I love to preach. I love to hear Max preach as much as anyone does. But these study tools allow you to go deeper in your relationship with God, especially if you are going through these study tools with other people and going deeper in your relationship with other people. We can grow together. And that's exactly what we want to do right now. And and distance does not have to keep us from doing that. We can continue to grow. Well, right now, I wanna wanna pray for us, and then I wanna get us right into our message. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We are grateful that you you have pursued us, you have run after us, you have not let us go. Even when we were running the other direction, you have you have still pursued us, Father, that you would send your one and only Son, that we might have everlasting life, that we would not perish. Now, Father, as we come to your word, I ask that you would just show us what it is that you want us to see. Let us hear what it is that you want us to hear. And Father, we want to see Jesus. In this moment, would you bless us to see Jesus and only Jesus? In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we are in a series we are calling Searching for Springtime because let's be honest, 2020 has felt a little bit like a long, long, long winter. And if you're wondering when it's going to be over, well, join the club. Many of us are. The other day I I found this t-shirt. It had Doc Brown, you know, from the movies, Back to the Future movies, and, and Doc Brown and on it, it said, whatever you do, Don't set it to 2020. I thought, that's funny. And then I thought, yeah, maybe too soon. Because here we still are. We're still right in the middle of it. But speaking of being in the middle of it, Max left us in the middle of the story of Esther last week. In fact, he left us in chapter 4. And he left us with quite a cliffhanger. If you are just joining us, I want to quickly catch you up. We have a young, beautiful Jewish girl named Esther who has become Queen Esther of Persia, which is really pretty remarkable in and of itself. But enter, I mean, just about the time that it seems like things couldn't get any better, enter Haman the Agagite. Haman is like He's the villain. I mean, if this were a Victorian melodrama, he'd be the guy that we'd be booing as he walked on stage, you know, twirling his little mustache. No, I mean, that is, that is Haman. And the, the thing with Haman is he's not just filled with prejudice against the Jews. Well, he's also very powerful. And so we've got this, this mix of power and prejudice against the Jews. When one day he comes across Mordecai, a Jew who refuses to bow down to him. Now, this just makes Haman come totally unhinged. And so what does he do? Haman goes to the king and he gets the king to sign an edict that basically would allow the annihilation of the entire nation of the Jews, which Esther happens to be one. Of. Well, this leads us to where we left off last week, and that is with Esther's decision. She knows that she has a decision to make. What is she going to do? She knows that she has to go before the king, but there is just one little eensy teensy problem with this, and this is what we see here in, in Esther 4. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, and here it is. The king's one law is that they be put to death unless, unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. This is Esther speaking. 30 days have gone. You can start to sense. She knows what she has to do, but she, she, first of all, she's faced with this impossible situation. And now all the what ifs are starting to fill her head. Well, what, what, if, what, if, the, the, what if the king's in on it? I mean, what if, what if one of the guards or what if Haman finds out what I'm up to? Or, or what if the king just doesn't care? Or what if the king is just not that into me anymore? I mean, what, what if, what if? And she knows that she has this decision that she is going to have to go before the king and yes, 
unsolicited. And she knows that she's going to risk her life. But not only that, think about this. Not only is she going to risk her life for that, but once, even if she gets that far, now she has to challenge one of the most powerful men in the entire empire, Haman. And so she knows that she has this before her. But I want you to see what, what happens. We see that on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. Let's just, and then he goes on. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Whew, isn't that good news? She made it. He, there she is. She's in a royal robe. She's standing in the inner court where he can see her from, the, from his throne. And he, he does it. He, he welcomes her in. He extends the scepter. Now, can I just be honest with you for just a second? Just a moment of, of true confession here. Uh, I've read the story many times. And um, as a, a younger less mature me. I have read this story many times and I just thought, I mean, duh. I mean, there's no, no surprise here. I mean, who couldn't have seen this coming? I mean, everyone knew that he was going to lower the scepter. I mean, if you're confused about this, just do like I did as the younger, less mature me and read Esther 2, 7, which says, blah, 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 lovely figure and was beautiful. Okay, please don't send me any emails. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just, I'm just telling you how, how I approach this. But, you know, she goes before the king and you think, well, of course. I mean, it was her looks, it was her beauty that got her this far and surely he's gonna welcome her in. You know, what, what is the, the big deal? But if you've read Esther the same way that I did and, and just kind of a superficial reading, you might think that it was her good looks that, that changed the, the heart of the king but I would submit to you that there's something deeper going on there. And I don't want you to make the same mistake that I have made. I want us to, to look a little bit deeper and see if there's something else that's going on here. See, I, I no longer believe that it was her good looks. I, I no longer believe that it was her beauty that turned the king's head and eventually turned this entire story on its head. But there was something else going on. I wonder if we could go back to Esther chapter 4 and see what that is. Let's read together. First of all, we see that this is Esther's desperation. Okay, so her decision has moved to desperation. So what is she going to do? And so here we come back and we see that Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who were in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law and if I perish, I perish. We see here that her decision has now turned to desperation. But she is not, even though she is desperate, she is not in despair. Why? Well, because Esther knows where to place her trust. And Esther understood this truth. We face our challenge by seeking the face of God first. We face our challenge by seeking the face of God first. It's not that we back down from our challenge, but it's that as we do that, we go to God first. You see, I believe that Esther, that what turned this whole story, it was not just her beauty. You see, because before we see Esther beautiful and brave, we see her bow. But we see her bow not to the king of Persia, but first, to the king of kings. She understood this truth that we face our challenge by 
seeking the face of God first. It's what she chose to do. And you know, I can't help but think that the Apostle Paul might not agree with this. Let's look at this. We do live in the world, but we do not fight in the same way the world fights. We fight with weapons that are different from those the world uses. Our weapons have power from God that can destroy the enemy's strong places. Friends, that's what we need, isn't it? I mean, don't we need power, real power that can destroy the enemy's, the, the stronghold of the enemy? We typically, when it comes to a challenge, we tend to think, well, what am I going to do about this? And we start to, we start to go to what, what are we going to do? What can we do about this? What, what can we do to change this? And the truth is the thing that we need to do is do what Esther did and to go in prayer. Because this is where the power is that will actually break down the strongholds of the enemy. To go before God in prayer. That's where the power's at. We need to find the weapon that Esther found. We need to use the weapon that the early church used. Esther found it. The early church found it. I want us to go to Acts chapter 12. As we go into the New Testament, we see the same thing play out in Acts chapter 12. What's happening here is this time you have Herod. Not Haman, but he might as well have been Haman because Herod hated Christians. And Herod wanted to annihilate all the Christians. In fact, he had already killed James and his popularity Popularity skyrocketed so fast that he decided to go after Peter, and he's captured Peter. And I want you to see here that he, we find Peter. He put Peter in jail and handed him over to the guarded, uh, over to the guards. And this should be 16, 16 soldiers. So they put 16 soldiers around him. Now I want to. Last week, Max gave you a little bit of um, multiple choice, and I thought, man, that's fun. Let's do it again. So let's see what the scripture says. I want you to just get the picture. Here, Peter is in jail, and the church is concerned. So what did they do? Could it be they trolled Herod's Instagram? Okay, not likely. If you're wondering what that is, just ask your grandchildren. How about this one? They picketed for Peter. Hmm. Or how about this one? They called their local representative. Uh, okay, how about this one? They planned a jailbreak. I mean, that sounds like something, right? Like you could actually do that. Maybe, maybe that's it. Uh, how about this one? They started a phone campaign. Uh, so which one do you think that actually happened in Scripture? That's right. None of them. Trick question. That's not what the church did. Now, if I was Peter and I was the one in jail, I might have thought, you know, guys, is there something else you might be able to, you know, could you do something like this or that? But here's what scripture actually says. It says the church earnestly prayed for Peter. They prayed for him out of options. No solutions. All they had was prayer. But because all they had was prayer, I want you to see all that happened. As we continue to read, it says, Suddenly an angel of the Lord stood there and a light shined in the cell. The angel struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Hurry, get up, the angel said. And the chains fell off Peter's hands. Friends, what I want us to see here is that when you pray, you are not just offering up some words. You are waging spiritual warfare. You're, you're waging war against the enemy when you pray. And I don't know, I mean, be careful because when you pray, you might just be sending somebody, an angel in their direction. I mean, how else do we explain those moments where, let's be honest, we had given up? 
But somehow we got through. Could it be that we got up off of our knees because somebody else was willing to get on theirs? Maybe it was your mom. And, and dads, let's, I mean, hey, let's not let moms have all the fun. Let's get on, in on the action here. We can be praying for our families. I mean, I know us. We, we work hard. We coach the teams. We sacrifice. But are we leveraging the most powerful force in the universe for our families? Do they see us pray? Do they hear us pray for them out loud? Want to change the world? And dads, let's change the practice of prayer in our families. I don't know. All, all I know is that a group of people got together at Mary's house and they showed up and they began to pray. And because they showed up and prayed, an angel showed up in Peter's cell. I mean, if you, if you knew, do you know anyone who could use an angel sent their way? And if you do, if you believe that you had that kind of power, would you withhold it? Or would you release it? I mean, that's, that's really the key question, isn't it? I mean, do we believe? Do we believe in promises like this in Matthew 21? Whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Do we believe it? And how about this question? Does our behavior reflect our belief in this promise? We are confident that he hears us. We're confident that he hears us. Whenever we ask for anything that pleases him, and since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know he will give us what we ask for. Could it be that we don't have because we have not asked for it. You see, Esther found this gift of prayer in fasting. She called the people together because what happened was Esther's decision turned to desperation, but not to despair, and it actually turned to Esther's determination. Esther was determined to call the people to fasting and prayer. She and Mordecai called them to prayer. They were determined to, to seek their challenge, yes, but to seek the face of God first. And I want you to just see the heart of Mordecai in this. Look at this. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. You see, when we determine to pray, uh, we're not just talking about offering up some words. We're not, we're not just talking about well, like what we call sometimes a, a foxhole prayer, where it's this kind of prayer. It's like, God, I'm in a lot of trouble right now, and I really need you to help me right now. Okay, there's, there's nothing wrong with those prayers, but we're talking about something else. We're talking about, you see, Mordecai was not just saying, help me. He was saying, forgive me, forgive me. He was grieving. He, during this time, he was, he was grieving his own sin. He was grieving the sin of his people. He was grieving the oppression of the people. He wept. But though he was desperate, he did not slip into despair. Yet he was determined he determined to pray. And so did Esther. She said, it's time to pray. She called the nation for three days. All right, everyone, here's what we're going to do. Here's the plan. We are going to fast and we are going to pray. And she did for three days. She fasted with them. For three days, she went without food, without water. For, for, for three days, she weakened. You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, a, a Jewish commentary on the book of Esther reveals that, that the Jews believed that redemption comes on the third day. That redemption comes after the darkness. 
that redemption comes after weakness. You know, that's really interesting, and I think we see some of these same things taught in the New Testament as well. Look at this. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is weak. I know, I know, I know. We don't like weakness. We try to stay as far away from weakness as we possibly can, but God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God's own son. He sent him to this earth. Did anyone ever seem weaker than the son of God being hung on a cross, gasping for his last breath, being laid in a, in a tomb? Yet on the third day, God the father raised his son from the dead and he defeated sin and death and gained redemption not only for himself, but for us all. But if you're familiar with the story of Jesus, do you remember what happened before the cross, before the tomb, before the resurrection? If we backed up just a little bit, you would find Jesus in a garden. The garden of Gethsemane. And what was he doing then? He was praying. Knowing what all was coming before him, what did Jesus choose to do? He chose to pray. In desperation to his father, but he was not in despair. He determined to pursue the will of his father. He said, not my will be done, but yours be done. You see, even Jesus knew that we seek our challenges, but we seek the face of God first. Could it be, could it be that what God is calling us to right now is to seek his face first? Do we have challenges? Of course we have challenges. But maybe these challenges are an opportunity for us to get on our knees and to point ourselves towards God and to pray to him and to say, God, you are our only hope. Now, we could try to kind of make sense of things. We could try to figure things out. Or we could come to him in some honest, get on our face, get on the floor kind of prayer with God. Could it be that's the only thing that stands between us in a season of springtime? I mean, what if? What if that's the only thing that separates us? What if the only thing that separates our city from a movement of revival is the church getting serious about prayer? What if? Could it be that God is calling us to a time of prayer? Church, I want to invite you this next week. We're gonna practice what we're preaching here. And I wanna invite you this next week to join us for a 24-hour period of fasting and prayer. It's going to begin Tuesday evening at 714 and it's going to end Wednesday evening at 714. Now, if you're wondering, okay, what's the significance about 714? That's saying, well, I'm so glad that you asked. Here's why. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my, what does that say? Face seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I want to invite us to join together. And just like Esther and Mordecai, putting out the word, it is time to pray. Well, church, it is time to pray now. It's time to pray for our city. It's time to pray for our nation. It's time to pray for our world that God would be glorified throughout all of the earth. And so I wanna invite you to consider that. You, know, you may have a lot of questions. Well, you know, uh, here's the thing. Just make the decision to join us. We're gonna do a Facebook Live event at 7.14 on Tuesday, and then we're gonna do one at 7.14 in the morning, and 7.14 in the, in the evening. We're gonna, we're gonna do this together. But here, here's the thing. If you need to repent, then 
do it. If you need to shout out, if you need to cry out to God, if you need to file a complaint with God, then do it. Remember who you're talking to. This is your father. He loves you. He is for you and he is with you and he sent his one and only son to die for you. That's the father that you are talking to. And he is ready and he is willing and he is able to rescue you. So what do you say we come before him and we just ask? What do you say this time we ask together? In addition to the opportunity for us to gather together for a 24 hour period of fasting and praying, I want you to know that you're gonna have an additional opportunity next Sunday to join with our city to join with our city together to pray. You can find the details about that. It's October 25th, and you're gonna find more of the details on that uh, at prayessa.org. So two opportunities for us to pray. One, we gather with the church, we fast and pray. And the other, we gather with our city to pray. Two opportunities, but one heartbeat and one prayer. And that is for our city, our nation, and our world. I want to invite you to do both of those things. And right now, I have invited one of our new elders, Heath Jackson, if he would, to come and lead us in a special time of prayer. Let's pray for our country. Lord, we come to you today on behalf of this great country. We come to you in a time of overwhelming fear, identity crisis, and increasing division. We're inundated by racial tension, gender conflict, generational strife, political feuds, religion wars, and more. We're a country in desperate need of healing. Lord, we come to you seeking a restoration of a country that was founded in your name and in your holy word. We thank you for your abundant blessings on this land and its people. We thank you for financial wealth that's unrivaled in the history of your world. We thank you for generations of peace and for constitutional freedoms that allow your name to be spoken in public without fear of flogging. We thank you for founding fathers, heroic leaders, military veterans, and patriotic citizens throughout our history. We thank you not only for their bravery, their mental, spiritual, physical sacrifices, or even their lives that were given. We thank you for their pursuit in your name. With your voice in their pens and arms, with your holy word in their decisions, with your strength and protection from evil. We thank you for being a fair and forgiving father. Though we constantly surrender to the temptations that fill David's songs and the same temptations and sins that have defeated the most brilliant leaders, armies, most prosperous countries, we thank you for choosing to forgive. Forgive us of our selfishness. Forgive us for forsaking and ignoring those in need. Forgive us for our silence when our voice could bear witness to your greatness. Forgive us for unending noise when a listening ear or a whisper was the right action. Lord, in this day of overwhelming information, let us hear your voice over the noise. Help us to know your word and to recognize the lies of this world. Give us the patience and the wisdom to see the truth and give us the authority to speak your word. Give us the courage to live our lives so that no person or demon questions our allegiance. Let our marriages be a beacon of light to the people that questions the sanctity that it represents. Let our families be a model of righteousness to a world that doesn't value its power. And in a time when we celebrate Pilate and Herod, let us serve Jesus and be the servant leaders with him as our eternal example as you did with Esther. Please hear our prayer and forgive our sins. It's in you we trust, in you we place our faith. We praise your glory and we proclaim your greatness in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you, Heath. Church, we are going to pick up the same weapon that Esther picked up, the same weapon that the early church picked up. We are going to pick up the weapon of prayer. 
And right now I want to invite you to pick up your, your elements for communion because we are about to celebrate where we place our hope, where we place our trust. Remember, our, the power of prayer is not in the one who prays, but in the one who listens. And the one who listens gave his one and only son. And so right now, if you'll pick up your bread and your juice, we're going to have a song together and then we'll be guided together to take communion together as a family. mentioned healing that's needed as Heath prayed and prayer that's needed as Travis has mentioned and there's been some praying going on this week because one of our own worship volunteers son had a an accident on his bicycle where it tore his pancreas and the word went out to pray so we did in the response that God gave was from the two scans that showed those tears when they went in to do the surgery the tear was very minimal and so now the the recovery time and things are going to be a whole lot shorter and a lot easier on little Liam's life so we thank God for that miracle as we continue to pray for him and we thank God for the, the miracle of his son, Jesus, on the cross, his sacrifice for us. And that's why at this time we take this bread representing his body. Let's do that together. This juice that represents his blood shed for us. Lord, we thank you for your, your healing hand. Lord, we lift our prayers to you. We cry out to you, Lord. In Jesus' name.
Xerxes held out a golden scepter, but Jesus stretches his nail-pierced hand to touch you wherever you may be in this moment. Though you may be walking through an ocean of fears, God desires to split the sea and guide you through to the other side. We wanna pray for you, no matter where you are, no matter what you may be going through. And it is our desire to walk with you moment by moment through every up and down that you are facing in your life. Barbara, Mike, and Sherry Lynn, we're praying for your physical healing. Connie, we're asking God to provide that job for your son-in-law. Renee, Laura, and Shelly, we are praying that God will provide for your financial needs. If you have a need, simply text PRAY to 210-585-2585. Our elders, our staff, and our prayer ministers will cover your needs with our prayers. We also want you to continue to engage and study God's Word this week as we continue to study the book of Esther. You can download our Searching for Springtime weekly study sheets. They are one-page study sheets with study questions, prayer prompts, personal practices, and scripture reading suggestions. We want you to continue to engage with us this week as we study God's Word. And lastly, 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If we will humble ourselves and pray and seek His face, He will hear our cries and heal our land. Don't forget to join us this week on Tuesday evening at 7.14 p.m. and spend the next 24 hours fasting and praying as we seek God to heal our land. You can go on to Oak Hills Church on our Facebook page and watch our virtual event as we will have some live prayer moments and also worship. Now, we want to encourage you this week to be disciples who make disciples that follow Jesus moment by moment. Be strong and courageous Hold on to what is true Remember His promise That God will deliver you Be strong and courageous not on our own we stand His power and presence Will give us His promised land Remember all He's done Remember all He's done For us Remember all He's done Remember all He's done Come